Hello, we want to welcome you to the worship services of First United Methodist Church here in downtown Camden, Arkansas. We are so glad that you are joining us either by YouTube or by FM 97.1. Today is the last and fifth Sunday in January, and we have gathered here to worship in thanksgiving and praise. Let us prepare our hearts. Thou art all compassion, pure. 
This is our second week to look at Paul's letter to the church at Thessalonica. This is probably the earliest writing we find in the New Testament, written somewhere right before uh, A.D. 50. Paul had gone to Thessalonica, and he and Timothy and Silas had preached in the synagogue there, also had preached in, in the town square, and within a month, they had the beginnings of a new church. But their visit there was cut short because there suddenly became a very hostile climate, and the church was being persecuted. So Paul and Silas and Timothy had left, and Paul was concerned. So they're now in Athens or in Corinth, and he's very concerned about what has happened. So he sends Timothy back to Thessalonica to see if the church was still surviving. And what he found was not only were they surviving, they were actually thriving well. So when Timothy comes back with this report, Paul writes this letter of encouragement. The letter is in two parts, and each part is framed by a prayer. So last week we looked at the beginning prayer and what that led to. Today we're looking at the prayer that binds the first part to the second part, and then there is a prayer at the end. We see in... Paul's letter and this first prayer, the recurring themes of faith, hope, and love. But we also see that Paul is concerned that he and Timothy and Silas tried to be examples to the people. So they had something to imitate. They had something tangible to understand. And his hope was by them imitating him, they could become examples for others. So let me read to you from the ninth, from the third chapter of First Thessalonians, 
starting with verse 9. How can we thank God enough for you, given all the joy we have because of you before our God? Night and day we pray more than ever to see all of you in person and to complete whatever you need for your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus guide us on our way back to you. May the Lord cause you to increase and enrich your love for each other and for everyone in the same way as we also love you. May the love cause your hearts to be strengthened, to be blameless in holiness before our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all of his people. Amen. So then, brothers and sisters, we ask and encourage you in the Lord Jesus to keep living the way you already are and even do better in how you live and please God, just as you learn from us. You know the instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May your scripture always be my delight, O Lord. May I not be deceived in them or deceived by them. Amen. About eight years ago, I got a phone call that I was being moved to Maumelle, Arkansas to serve a church in a planned community. The church was only about 30 years old. And I would have a pretty large staff to manage. I had two associate pastors, a youth director, a children's director. I had a preschool. I had the administrative staff. Uh, and I had all the teachers in the preschool. But for me, one of the more interesting relationships was in one of my associate pastors named Pat Henry. Pat was actually an ordained deacon, and I had not worked with a deacon before. But he was an outstanding musician. He played in a jazz band currently. He had mastered about 17 different instruments. And in his younger days, he had played the trumpet, which was his favorite instrument for the band Three Dog Night. He had quite a background. But he was also a piano tuner. And at least once a month, he would sit down at the grand piano in our sanctuary, and he would take out his set of tuning forks and he would hit the tuning fork and adjust the strings on the piano to be in perfect alignment and be in tune. He hated for any instrument to be out of tune. And this was great since the piano was our main instrument in the sanctuary. And so every Sunday morning, it was right in tune. If you go to a symphony, you will notice that before everything begins, before the conductor comes out, the first violinist stands up and begins to play and tune her instrument. And when she gets it in line, the whole orchestra joins in to be in line with his or her pitch on that first violin. They do that before the conductor even comes out. And if it is a long symphony and two parts where there's an intermission, you will see them once again tune their instruments to the first violin because no one wants to be out of line. There is one pitch, one pitch alone, and the whole orchestra 
tunes to that one pitch. So today, I want to talk to you about holiness. Holiness is the way that we live that pleases God. And in our scriptures, we discover that God and God alone is holy. We see when God first encounters Moses at the burning bush that he tells Moses to take off your shoes, you are standing on holy ground. Later, when he is on Mount Sinai giving Moses the instructions for the people, when Moses comes down, his face is literally a glow from being in the presence of God's holiness. When you go over to Leviticus and you see the instructions for building the tabernacle and later the temple, there was a place within the tabernacle called the Holies of Holy. It is where the seat of atonement was. It was where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. The most holy and sacred things, things that God had made holy. There were instructions on who could enter that room and survive. And you had to become pure. You had to go through a purification ritual to prepare yourself to enter that space of holiness. We see in the history of Israel, there were times when the Ark of the Covenant was taken out and someone would accidentally approach it or touch it to keep it from falling and they would die instantly because they could not purify themselves before they touched something that's holy. This is the way it was until we get to the story of Isaiah. And in the sixth chapter of Isaiah, which the adult Sunday school classes, uh, this was in their lesson from a few weeks ago, we find Isaiah entering into a holy space in the very throne room of God. And there's incense, and there's coal, and there's fire. He can see the rim of God's garment. And he sees these holy creatures flying around. And suddenly he knows that he is not pure. And he cries, Woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips. And then something changes. Isaiah doesn't die. Instead, one of these holy winged creatures takes a coal and he puts that burning coal on Isaiah's lips, making Isaiah holy. And he tells him that now his sins have been forgiven. He has been touched by God. He has been touched by the holy and now he is ready. This is almost a precursor to the New Testament where we see God holiness God's Word taking on human flesh. And as this child grows, things change. What Jesus touches becomes whole. What Jesus touches becomes holy. He makes the blind to see and the lame to walk. He makes those that are bleeding suddenly healed. And so this holiness 
is spread. It is God and God alone that can make us holy. But Paul, early in his ministry when he was called Saul, he saw holiness a different way. He saw holiness in that ancient Leviticus way. That he was following the laws, that he was preparing himself to enter the holiest of holies. Then, that day on the road to Damascus, he encounters true holiness in Christ. And it changes him. His encounter on that road healed him, forgave him, and entered into his life the Holy Spirit that changed his outlook. Before that, holiness for Paul was following the laws, all 618 of them. And as we heard in that introduction in Philippians, he was blameless before the law, but he wasn't holy. What he discovered is that holiness comes from God. When the Holy Spirit touches you and transforms you through God's redeeming love, you are the one that gets tuned and changed. Holiness is aligning our humanity with God's love and God's will. Our will is shaped by the divine. Our will becomes defined by God's love. Our holiness is rooted in the love of God and the love of neighbor. Which means our holiness is not rooted in what we do. Our holiness is rooted in our hearts. It's the result of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. Something went right at the church of Thessalonica. Something happened that not only changed Paul, but changed how these people learned to relate to one another. What we see in this first half of, of Thessalonians is that the people had an appropriate relationship with one another. They had appropriate ethics and they had appropriate aspirations. And that had come from Paul and Timothy and Silas trying to be that example of being tuned by the Holy Spirit. Oh, problems will still spring forth as they do in any church. But overall, this tiny church in Thessalonica was handling and understanding things better than the other churches that were forming around them. And they were understanding it better than a lot of churches in this 21st century. So what was the difference? The difference was how they got to holiness. They got to holiness through the love of God as experienced by the Holy Spirit. Not in human rules of do's and don'ts, which we often substitute for the work of the Spirit. There's a huge difference between Paul's understanding now and Paul's understanding then. Then, when he was playing by all the rules, it was within his control. It was something he did 
It was something he could be proud of. When we believe that we can achieve holiness through following the rules and within our own control, then we often get competitive, just as we saw the disciples get competitive and just as we're going to see the church at Corinth get competitive. When we get competitive because we are doing something that we believe inflates us, we get judgmental and we start things, saying things like, I'm holier than you are because, and you can just fill in the blank. I'm holier than thou because I read my Bible every day. I'm holier than thou because I never miss church. I'm holy than thou because I'm not divorced. I'm holier than thou because my children don't use drugs. I'm holier than thou because I don't drink. I'm holier than thou because I was baptized by immersion. I'm holier than thou because I serve on this committee or that committee. Friends, that is not what makes us holy. God makes us holy. When we work with the Holy Spirit to align our will with God's, we will have a different set of questions as we see in the church at Thessalonica. What would God have me do? Are my actions today and this decision I made, is it showing the love of God? With what I'm about to say or what I'm about to do, is God's love present in that? As Paul worked to show the love of God in Christ Jesus, his life changed. And his life became one to be imitated. And as his students learned how to love others through aligning their will with God's will, their lives also became examples. And that's how it's intended to work. As a result, Paul was writing out of gratitude because in truth, they had taught him as much as he had taught them. As we learn to work with the Holy Spirit and we learn to align our will with God's, then we become better examples of God's love and God's compassion, God's hope, God's faith, God's justice, and God's mercy. And it can change the world one life at a time. But I have to remind you that we are not the tuning fork. We are the instrument. It is the Holy Spirit that you hit. And it creates the perfect tone. And we align ourselves with that instrument. We engage with that instrument through prayer, through our study of the scriptures, for gathering with friends to learn and to grow and to pray together, through worship, through self-reflection, through service. All these things help us stay in tune as they challenge us how to live. So let me tell you a little bit more about my friend, Pat Henry. Pat had been in remission for several years from cancer. And not long after I became the senior pastor there, his cancer came back. And for the next eight months, 
I got to travel a journey with Pat. And every time I visited with him, whether I was visiting with him in the hospital or we were working together on something at the church or I was visiting in his home, what I watched was this man becoming more and more and more in tune with the Spirit. On Easter Sunday, and it was first Easter Sunday for both of us, he was so weak that he had to be lifted up to the chancel area. And he had put together a, a, a brass quartet and normally he would play trumpet, but he was too weak to play trumpet, so he was playing trombone. And our chancel wasn't very big, so he was sitting right next to me as he played. He was in perfect tune. Not a single note off, as sick as he was. And just a few days later, he would be playing a different kind of music in a place where he was finally whole and healed. But for me, it changed how I understood being in tune being in tune with God, and being in tune with the Spirit, and being in tune with our life together. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now we stand as we affirm our faith together with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, who was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. to see all the great possibilities in serving God and the wondrous journey which God has placed before us. But I don't have love in my heart and in my actions. I'm just making empty noises. Lord, too often we're like loud clanging symbols or empty promises. We say we want to do things, but we back away because we think things will be too hard. We don't believe that you will be with us, guiding, healing, strengthening us for service. So rather than do your work, we just go through the motions. But you are love. In you resides all the hope and peace and justice. Your love has been poured out on us and all creation from before the beginning of time. Teach us again the great message of hope. Remind us that love is also at risk. We risk censure and alienation from people who don't understand. Let us know that you were with us through this time. Give us courage to be your faithful witnesses. 
by the kinds of loving service and care we give to others. For we ask this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now will you join us in our hymn of invitation and dedication? O oh, Master, let me walk with thee. Amen. Mm -hmm. 